As Father Randolph was fond of saying, good morning, church. Those words have a greater poignancy as I look out to an empty church, uh, but to people who are indeed the church, to you in your homes. And every Sunday when we say good morning, church, we say good morning not just to the space, not just to the people gathered, but to the whole of what it is to be church, to all the people that have bound their lives together, who have pledged to walk this journey together. And so I say, good morning, church. Whether you're watching it in the morning or in the afternoon, I say, good morning, church, to you, part of the body of Christ, to you, a brother, to you, a sister. I pray that you're well. It's been a trying two weeks, and now we're, we're in two weeks, and uh, we begin our third week in this new reality that we live in. And I hope you're finding ways to stay connected. What I encourage you to do is to share those ways that you're finding to stay connected. Uh, people have shared ideas with me, and I'd love to share them with the broader community. Uh, one suggested that, um, that they ordered pizzas uh, together at different houses and, uh, uh, and called each other as they had a glass of wine and pizza and they shared company. Uh, so whether we're uh, ordering pizza or whether we're cooking dinner, uh, maybe as we sit down to dinner, if we're sitting uh, alone, uh, we call a friend who's also sitting down to dinner and, uh, and they become our, our, our table fellowship, our brothers and sisters. Uh, maybe there's other ways that we reach out. Um, maybe uh, we... Uh, we gather in the same way that we did before this, uh, although in a new way. Uh, I know our bistro group, uh, who normally gathers over at the hospital, gathered online. Uh, I encourage you to not just find new ways to reach out to people and to reach out to uh, especially those folks uh, that might not have somebody uh, in their household uh, or who may feel a little bit lonely or disconnected, as all of us feel a little lonely or disconnected, uh, but that we might share how we're reaching out. Uh, in new ways. Uh, I also encourage you to reach out to us. Um, let us know how you're doing. Uh, if you have any prayer needs, uh, if you have any, uh, any joys to share, if you just want to, uh, to have somebody uh, to talk to, don't hesitate to call. And, and uh, on that end or to that end, the vestry and other leaders in the church will be calling you all uh, uh, to, to find out how you're doing. And um, if you don't get a phone call, that may mean you're not in our directory and we'd like to hear from you. So, uh, so call us if you don't receive a call. Uh, but it's important that we remain the church, that we find new ways to stay connected. Uh, and I encourage you to check out all of our online resources, our daily meditations, our, um, our weekly news to see what's going on and to see uh, what updates are taking place. Uh, two updates that I think are important to share uh, one is, uh, is particularly uh, difficult to share, and that is that we will not be having Holy Week in the same way that we have, have done in years past, and it has been uh, absolutely awesome. Uh, there's no other word for it uh, to describe uh, the number of hands that, uh, uh, and feet that filled this space uh, during that week preparing uh, for all of the different uh, events of Holy Week from Palm Sunday uh, through Easter Day and to not have all of those hands expressing their faith by doing mostly the invisible work that takes place in, uh, in creating uh, the stage for, uh, for God's dramatic act that changed the world forever. Uh, but trust me, uh, we are going to find new ways to be church. Uh, we're going to find new ways to tell uh, that story that penetrates our heart and soul. Um, and I think this will be a meaningful and, and unforgettable Holy Week. Uh, I hope uh, that you all uh, can tune in uh, to all of the, the different services as they'll be done in new and different ways, ways, uh, ways designed uh, to impact you in your household or wherever you're able to, uh, to watch those services. But... Uh, but do in fact know we will have Holy Week, uh, we will have Easter, uh, and uh, maybe we'll postpone our, our real Easter celebration uh, when, uh, to a time when we can all come back together again. Uh, we don't know when that will be, but uh, at current, uh, the bishop has said that it, uh, uh, it is likely uh, that it will be after Easter, and as long as um, that's the recommendation from uh, the CDC and from the diocese, uh, we will not have Holy Week or, uh, or Easter Day services. 
Um, the other announcement that's uh, every bit as heavy uh, but, but also comes with joy and pride uh, that uh, Jesse, who's been here almost as long as I have, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the best moves that I made uh, early on in my time here uh, was forming an a incredibly uh, faithful and diligent search committee uh, and really going through an, a, a, a very uh, extensive process to find the person that we needed uh, to transform our music program and we uh, we certainly did we found uh, we found Jesse uh, and uh, he has uh, delivered on uh, all of that and then some uh, he has been a transforming agent not just for our music program uh, but for our church and uh, we are incredibly proud of uh, the work that he's done the way that he's built up uh, uh, the music program here the way that he's enlivened uh, all of our liturgies and, and especially those uh, most poignant liturgies uh, and and, um, and it is with deep sadness, uh, but deep pride and, uh, and joy for Jesse uh, that, uh, that I announced what you probably already read, uh, that he's accepted a call uh, to Abilene, Texas, and that uh, he will only uh, be with us for a few more weeks. Uh, we're not sure yet uh, whether the, we'll have that opportunity that he so richly deserves and that we so much want to afford him um, to hear him play in person and to be able to celebrate um, uh, his time here and his, his new journey. Uh, but our hearts are all toward him and, and we'll figure out a way, uh, it may be down the road, but we'll figure out a way to, uh, uh, to celebrate his time with us and, uh, and our pride in him and our gratitude for him. But, uh, uh, but we are indeed thankful for, uh, for you. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Uh, uh, and, um, and as uh, we have our abbreviated service, I also encourage you to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, if there are thoughts or ideas that, uh, that this gospel or the sermon uh, spark in you, if there's uh, a discussion that you'd love to take place afterward, uh, send it to me, either, um, either uh, the best way is on Facebook so we can have sort of an interactive dialogue, um, but uh, liturgy is the work of the people, and I know from your households that's a little bit more difficult, uh, but we can make this interactive, and I would uh, appreciate your, your feedback or your thoughts or things that would help carry you or encourage you uh, during this season. Uh, and, and I hope uh, to have a lot of resources online, uh, not just for worship and our spiritual life, uh, but about our self-care and our care of those closest to us. Uh, so look forward uh, to, to more of that, both from the, the church and the, the school site as well, uh, as we try to care for one another. Um, with that, I'd like to begin with the collect for the day. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'd like to take a moment to pray. And I'm going to leave silence in this prayer, and I hope wherever you are watching this, or whenever you're watching this, uh, that you fill that space with your own prayer petitions. Let us pray. Most loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for all the days that you give us, for this community, for the love that binds us, your love that is poured into this place and beyond this place, that is poured into our hearts that continues to hold us together. We ask prayers for all of us who feel anxious and lonely, who feel the responsibility of care for others. Help us to connect with one another. Help us to envision new ways that we can reflect your body, your love, your grace, and your presence. Be with the care workers. Be with all those who risk so much to make people well. Be with all those making preparations. Give us all a wisdom to know how to best care for others, to make sacrifices during this season as they're necessary. To be with those who live alone, those who depend on our coming together for community. Help them know that we're with them. Help us find new ways to be with them. Be with those who are sick or hurting. 
those affected by this virus. Be with those at the national and global level who make decisions for our welfare. Now I ask in this silence for you to fill this space and your space with your own prayers. For Jesse and his ministry with us. For the larger church. For this Holy Week and Easter, that it may touch our hearts in new ways. for each of you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And I know last Sunday I went straight to uh, reading the gospel, but the psalm for today, the appointed psalm, is Psalm 23. Uh, and I cannot begin to tell you how frequently uh, these words have provided comfort in hospital rooms, uh, uh, around loved ones, uh, at the time we lay our loved ones to rest, and just in our daily life. So I encourage you to hear these words uh, as words of presence of words of guidance as uh, a reminder that God is with us uh, in the valleys as, as well as on the mountaintops. The 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. As he walked along, Jesus saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind, and now it was Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. 
And then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, You put mud on my eyes, and then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they again said to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here's an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him. And the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment so that those who do not see may see. And those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This story has always resonated with me. I remember this was one of the first passages that I was tasked with preaching upon in seminary. I remember how carefully I worded each phrase and my repetition of phrase again and again, and how carefully I crafted that sermon for my homiletics class. And then I remember delivering it down the road at St. Stephen's Catlet. I think I was more concerned 
with my writing style, with my use of language, turn of phrase, than I was with the power of this story. This is a beautiful, beautiful story. And it's a story that encapsulates so much of our relationship with God, what God does for us again and again and again. And it struck me when I went to the Holy Land. When I went to the Holy Land, I expected to be moved by certain sites, and certain sites didn't move me, and certain sites did in ways I didn't expect. And as I walked out to what had only been discovered not long ago, the Pool of Siloam, all of a sudden it struck me. This is where it happened. One of the great things about the way that we have to do things now uh, during this uh, season that we find ourselves is that I can share things with you that I couldn't in person, uh, including pictures uh, of where I was standing, of what it was like to be right there uh, looking at the Pool of Siloam and thinking, this is where a child of God had his life restored, where he could see in ways that others who can see still can't see, where he was empowered to heal himself by a God who knew that was exactly what he needed. And it just washed over me. It washed over me looking at what's a fairly modest pool now as part of, uh, part of what the original pool would have been located upon uh, uh, is, is land held by other, uh, uh, other uh, folks. Uh, so they only were able to restore part of it. Uh, but when I looked at it and thought about this story, it just made me freeze in my place and think this is where human need was met with divine love and knowing. And it was, it was awesome. One of the things that strikes me about this story is how much it is dripping with our school's virtue of the month that we've been talking about, but with the very nature of God, compassion. The incarnation reminds us that God came and lived with us and experienced the fullness of life. And we heard that last week with the woman at the well, that Jesus knew her story deeply uh, and he engaged her when no one else would uh, in a way that heard her pain and her suffering, that met her truth uh, and acknowledged it and healed and redeemed it. Here, Jesus is filled with compassion. And as I taught the kids uh, in the weeks before we were out of school, uh, and as we record uh, a chapel as well, uh, during the time we're apart, the compassion comes from two words. Calm, which means with. And passion, that we understand now differently than originally, but originally it meant suffering. And so the passion of Christ, those uh, events we tell during Holy Week, are about Christ's suffering. But to have compassion is to suffer with, to feel with, to feel intensely with someone else. And the whole of this story shows the depth of which God has compassion for us. Think about this man. He was isolated. He was isolated in ways that we feel isolated now, but in ways that far surpass that he was isolated by his community who said, you can't come to church. That the way that we protect the whole is we keep you outside and we create a narrative that allows us to do that, that you are sinful. And because you were born blind, either you must have sinned in the womb, as difficult as that might be, or it was your parents' sin. So when this child was born blind, think about those two ways that that parent, those parents look at that child, both as that beloved child that they created and as a reminder that the society will never look upon them the same, as a stain on their family, as a scarlet letter that they must be sinful people. How difficult to have those two realities. That'll come back later in the story. But he's left to beg because nobody empowers him to do anything. Certainly, there is plenty within his capability 
but they have permission to leave him alone. And as they leave him alone, they don't just have permission to leave him alone, they have permission to forget about him, to allow him to become invisible as he begs for food to eat and any basic needs. He has become invisible. So invisible that the disciples who are following Jesus uh, make him an object lesson. Hey, Jesus is that guy right there, that guy we, can, uh, we don't even acknowledge uh, that he's in our company. That person, is he blind because of his sins or his parents' sins? Jesus heals him in such a physical way that we know that he is seen that we know that he matters, that his material life has substance to God. And especially during this time of isolation, I hope the way that he heals strikes you, that he enters into a place where we're not supposed to go. He spits. He spits. The most dangerous element we have right now, he spits. And he takes dirt and he rubs it into this man, this invisible man's eyes. And the second piece, he makes this man a co-creator in his new reality. He makes this man part of the story, not just the recipient of God's grace and mercy, but as a co-creator in his own narrative. He sends him to go heal himself. He sends him to go wash in those pools of Siloam. which means sent. Hold on to that too, which means sent. And so he does. So he goes and he takes the hands and the body and the mud that God has touched him with, that God has spat upon and rubbed in his eyes, and he goes and think about how much more difficult it is for him to go and find his way to the pool of Siloam, but that's part of what he needed because God had such compassion for him that God knew that. That God knew it would matter that he participated in his healing. And he was healed. Each healing story has elements of that. The hemorrhaging woman who grabbed the hem is the opposite story. It is she that, that crosses over all lines of, uh, of dignity and touches him, and he's, she's healed just by that touch. Here is Jesus that crosses that line to make the invisible visible, to touch the untouchable. So this story reminds me of God's compassion that God knows what we need deep down in our hearts, that God knows what we need to make it through these days, that God knows what we need in the wholeness of life, that the incarnation reminds us that no aspect of life is blind to God, that God knows, God sees, and God cares. The blind man has to participate in his own wellness. This has been a difficult few weeks, and partly because it binds those tensions that we have between God will take care of us, why is this happening, with our responsibility to do what we know we're supposed to do, to do what people who have God-given gifts have told us we need to do. We need to separate from one another. We need to do that not because we don't trust in God. We need to do that because God has equipped us with the skills to take care of each other, to take care of ourselves, and more importantly, to take care of one another. And right now, that requires us really being faithful to that social isolation, to that physical separation. And I think physical separation is a better term because we can socially come together while maintaining that. But we have to be participants in our wellness, just as this man was. Another thing that I took from this story that I encourage you to take from it, that piece of how we respond. The woman at the well became 
the apostle, the evangelist. She goes out afterwards and she tells everyone what has happened. This person knows my whole story. This person is of God. This person told me everything uh, that is in my heart uh, that people couldn't know, that somebody from the neighboring village from a different tribe could not know. He knew that about me and he still loved me, redeemed me, and was with me. And this man has the same thing. He comes back. And it's fairly dramatic how the blind man comes back. He comes back uh, and he's being questioned. Who did this to you? Are you the one who was blind? Are you him? Are you the one that couldn't see? They don't even recognize him. Not because he looks any differently, because he became so invisible that they can't even tell that it's the same person. They know he bears a likeness to that part of the landscape they walked by day in and day out. But Jesus sent him to the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And so he responds as a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And first they ask him, you know, uh, who did this? Tell me what you know. And he said, it's the prophet Jesus. It's the one they're talking about. Uh, uh, and they ask him all these questions. Well, uh, if he was healing on the Sabbath, if he's not uh, faithful to God's law, how could he do this? Uh, tell me more. And he says, you know what? This is what I know. I know I was blind and I was invisible and I was seen as less than. And this man came and he spit into his hands and he rubbed that mud together those elements that we talked about on Ash Wednesday as elements of our very creation that God breathed into the dust and made it human form. He recreated me. And I can see and I have a new identity and a new truth and I'm a new creation. And I got to participate in that creation. That's what I know. You can discern the rest. They were through with him, so they went and they asked his parents who were scared to death. The church made his parents scared to death. They were probably always on probation as far as their participation in the church. You can come, your son can't, but we have an eye on you. And they do. And they acquiesce. And they throw their son under the bus. He'd already been under the bus. And so they say, ask him, he's of age. Throw it on his shoulders. Yes, that's our son, and yes, he was blind, and now we can see, but that's as much as you're getting from us. Ask him. And by the time they bring him back, he's even more emboldened, even more sent to do the work that God has recreated him to do. He can see in ways that these men who can always see don't. And he says to him, you know, if this man were so bad, if this man were such a notorious sinner, how could he do what no one else could do? You all saw me as invisible. You all haven't touched me my whole life through. You all haven't made me well. No one has. But this man, whoever he may be, however sinful uh, you may think he is, God wouldn't give a sinful man the power to do what happened to me, to be able to see. So I can see. And so, yes, I am his disciple. I will follow that truth and that light. Someone who restored all that had been taken away from me, which was so much more than blindness. I will follow him. And he becomes a disciple. Those words, which mean sent, become his core identity. He has become a co-creator with the God who made him and then remade him out of that dust, out of that dirt that he spat into and rubbed on his eyes, out of that responsibility to go and wash in those pools of Siloam. Then another point. This story is so rich, it's so full. I don't think what's going on right now has much to do with God's intended purpose. I don't think we are being punished. I don't think this is about God's wrath or God's anger. Much like Jesus explicitly said that this blindness was not because of anything this man did or anything uh, that his parents did, but it's an opportunity. 
It's an opportunity for the blind to see and for this man to be recreated in a new way. I don't think there's much of a divine, a divine explanation for why we're going through what we're going through. I think God is with us. I think we'll make it because of our dependence on God. Because God is always with us. Because God is filled with compassion. Because of the incarnation that reminds us that we can't walk where God hasn't walked before. But I do think this is an opportunity for us to be able to see differently. To be recreated in new ways. As a community. As a person of faith. I encourage you to open your eyes to the way that God might be present with you in this. Open your eyes to the new ways that we are able to care for one another. Open your eyes to what really matters and how those bonds, those bonds we sometimes take for granted, become so indispensable during this season. God didn't make this happen, which is my personal belief. It's just my personal belief. God didn't make this happen, but I assure you, God is in the midst of this, and God's inviting us to be that new creation, to open our eyes like we can see for the first time, and to be sent. Amen. Remember that life is short. We have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who traveled the way with us. So be quick to be kind. Make haste to love. And the blessing of God Almighty in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Our worship is now ended and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.